glad to invite or welcome those that are joining us online as well, our online audience. Uh, thank you very much for being a part of our fellowship, and we uh, love hearing from you every week. I tell you that every week. I enjoy hearing uh, your prayer request and uh, questions and all of that as well, so God bless you, and we're glad to have you here. When I got up to do prayer time, I saw that we were blessed today to have a very special visitor today. Our mayor from Trophy Club is with us. Uh, mayor uh, Jay Tiffany is what I call her, you know, she uh, was written here. Will you stand up and let us just honor you today? We're glad that you're here with us. Tell her how much you're glad you're here, here with us. Bless you. So thankful for you. And I told her the other day, we did the 9-11 service, uh, I did the invocation at it, and she was speaking at it, and I said, we, you're our third lady mayor we've had since I've been here, and I still don't know how to refer to a lady mayor. Are you Madam Mayor? Are you Miss Mayor? Are you Mr.? She said, just call me Jeanette. And I said, no, i got to call you with your title. You know, I'm doing that. Yeah, pardon? Yes, come up here, come up here, so everybody can hear you. Come on. You, you got your Bible there. Just go ahead and preach today. You want to do that? No, but I just want to say to the town of Trophy Club, I sit there, I pray for you all the time. I, I accepted this opportunity because I knew that God had brought me here at just the right time, just the right time for Trophy Club because I believe Trophy Club has a great future. And... Um, it's all dependent upon God's plan. And I know every minister that I speak to, I say, please pray for us. I would be on campaign, and um, people would come to the door. they said, why are you doing this? I said, I think God called me to do this. And they'd put their arms around me and pray, not for me, but for Trophy Club. I believe that people like you are the reason we're here and I just need you to pray, okay? Please pray for Trophy Club. And we have had the opportunity, I'll just tell you right now, we will be announcing a town manager within the next week, and that will give us great direction. And I will say he has a moral compass, and I am so excited about it. Thank you, because God answers prayers. Thank you. Thank you for being here today. You're welcome anytime to be with us. I have to say one thing. When I uh, first went to do the invocation for our council meeting after she was elected, uh, I said, how can I pray for you? And she, uh, you said something to me. I have prayed this prayer for politicians in federal government, state government, everywhere. And she at, literally asked me, she said, would you just pray that I would always have the moral courage to do the right thing? And I thought, I pray that for people. I've never had someone ask me to pray that for them. And uh, you didn't have to run. You didn't have to step up at this time. And you did, and we're thankful. And I'm uh, thankful for what you're doing for our city very, very much. And uh, we, we're committed to praying for you. I want all of our prayer teams that know, if you don't know her, be sure to shake hands with her so you know uh, her by her face, and you, when you pray in our prayer teams for her, you know who you're praying for. So thank you for being here, and thank you for speaking those words uh, to us today. Well, take your Bible today and look at the next to last book in the Bible, Jude. Easy to find. Just go to Revelation and come back one, and you can come to this little book of Jude. We introduced this last week, and wow, wow, I wish that. You know, sometimes when you have a message, you just wish, I just really want to just preach that message all over again. Uh, this week because that thing was so uh, full of truth that we needed and the response uh, uh, was there. It's, um, it's found, and I, I skipped ahead to Jude 3 last week. Now Jude only has one chapter, so we just have verse numbers uh, there. And so I, we preached on Jude 3 last week. Now we're coming back to Jude 1 and 2 today. But Jude 3 is the key to the whole little epistle he has. He says, I was going to write to you about our common salvation. But, but I feel need, is, is really a necessity is the word that's used there, a burden to write to you to tell you to contend for the faith. And that's exactly what he's going to do, and he's going to teach us that as we go through this book verse by verse and learn from it. And last week we, we talked about what it means to contend for the faith and uh, to stand up for what we believe and uh, what, we're, uh, what we know is true. Not, uh, you know, sometimes it's, it's difficult and 
sometimes we get intimidated because people say, well, you shouldn't do that. We have a, you know, you should stay in your lane. And, and, and so it's, it's, you know, we have to navigate that in there. I love this little truth, and I'm, I'm going to get to my message in a minute. It'll be short, I promise. But um, y'all know that isn't true. But, uh, you know, uh, but anyway, the, uh, you know, uh, Jesus was asked one day a question. The, the, the Pharisees, the religious people came to him, and they, they had a coin with them, and it had Caesar's stamp on it. And they said, is it lawful for us to pay taxes to Caesar? Now, that was a huge loaded question in his day because they knew they had him on that question. At least they thought they did. Jesus never had an extra bit of sweat come on his head when they asked him a tough question because he always knew the answer. But they asked him quickly. They said, if he says yes, pay taxes to Caesar's, it would discredit him with his Jewish people who hated the Romans and hated the tax collectors for how they abused the system and took their money. If he said no, they'd go tell the Romans he's trying to rebel, and the Romans would, would have gotten him and put him in prison. So he's kind of, what's he going to do? And Jesus said, whose image is on that? And Caesar's. And he said, render unto Caesar what is Caesar, and unto God's what is God's. And what you've got to realize in that answer he gave us, he didn't give us a yes or no answer. He, he gave us an answer that let us know that there's always going to be this conflict between the world's kingdom and God's kingdom. And it's not going to be just as easy sometimes as a yes or no or do this or don't do that. It's going to have some, uh, we're going to have to pray. And, and this is the great thing about the Christian life. We want to sometimes exchange a meaningful personal relationship with God and the Holy Spirit and get a list of do's and don'ts. And that makes it easy. That's called legalism. Just, oh, well, Pastor, what does the Bible say we're supposed to do? Though? Okay, I won't do that. I will do this. I won't do that. I won't do that. That's not what it's about. It's about having a vital relationship with the living Lord Jesus through the Holy Spirit. And sometimes we have to let the Holy Spirit guide us. Now, there's some things that are absolute, but there are some things that he will guide us. And this is the time when you need to say this. This is the time when you need to say that. And uh, that's the exciting thing about walking uh, with God and doing that. And one of the main things... And I may come back and actually speak, maybe it's the first of the year, on, an, on a, maybe even a series of messages, because one of the things we learned about contending for in our day is for the creation order that God has given us. And I, I go back to that. I, I saw how that resonated last week, and I go back to that again just to remind you of this and, and, and recognizing that, because that's where our culture today has collapsed or is collapsing because we've walked away from creation. You know, before man sinned and the gospel was introduced, God instituted things that are for all of civilized societies. And first of all, the idea that in the beginning, God. First of all, if we believe in a creator, then we realize this, I'm not God. Our founding fathers of our country believe that way. Our, we are endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights. And I went back and read the whole Declaration of Independence this week. And it's amazing on every, every part of it, they're referring to the Creator. And they recognize that rights are not given by government. Rights are given by God. And so they, they put that in our founding documents. And so we realize how important if we walk away from that, we get in trouble. We also walk away from the idea that God said in the first chapters of Genesis, God created them male and female. Twice it tells us he did it that way. That's how God created us. When we rebel against that, we're not rebelling to try to express it. We're rebelling against the Creator's plan. You know, the plan for marriage is right there. For this reason, a man shall leave his mother and father and cleave unto his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. God gave us that. Marriage is the cornerstone of an orderly society. It's not just for Christians. It's for everybody. God gave us it. So when we have gone back now and destroy that created order or rebel against that created order, the, the culture collapses. Surprise. 5,000 years of recorded history and the Bible and the truth tell us that if you move away from creation principles, you can't function. And so when we're contending for the faith, that's one of the first things that we begin to talk about is that we have to stand on what God created, that he is the creator, that he has set a plan 
for the genders, that he has set a plan for uh, marriage and for roles like that in this world. So those, those are the things God's calling us to do. Contend for the faith. That's what it, we, we recognize, that we have to, have to speak up. The only thing needed, the great philosopher historian said, for uh, evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. And so there comes a time when you say, look, I'm not going to be intimidated and pushed in the corner. I must speak up. So let's look at, at Jude. Let me read to you the first two verses. And, and I want us to see a very, very simple truth today that comes out of verse 3. I'm going to go ahead and just read verses 1, 2, and 3 to you. Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, sanctified by God the Father, and preserved in Jesus Christ, mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. And then here's our verse. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, that's the letter he wanted to write, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. Now what I want to do in looking at verses 1 and 2 is recognize that if you're going to contend for the faith, one of the most foundational things that you have to settle in your life is the identity that you have in Christ. If you don't know who you are, you really are never going to be qualified or never going to be confident or be able to do what he calls you to do in verse 3. You have to get that settled first and foremost. Now, in our study of Jude, I'm doing something very different that I really have never uh, done quite this way before. I want to highlight along the way a time period in history that gives us some illumination on why we should do what he says in verse 3 and contending for the faith. And that time period that I'm going back to and referring to in every message is a time period, it was almost 100 years ago, it was a, roughly the decade of the 1930s, and it took place in a nation called Germany that uh, we know well about. And if you know a little history, you know that the period I'm talking about is the time period when a very modern, democrat, democratic republic nation was was seized by a dictator. And to study that in history is to study how in the world did that take place? And not only was he taken by him, but, but he unleashed evil on this world like we've never known really before in systematic ways. Went after one whole uh, race of people, the Jewish people, and, and, and literally in a, in a modern uh, systemized way tried to Take them off the place of, of earth. And not only that, I, I went back and looked. I didn't know the number, so I looked it up this week. Did you know that World War II that was a result of this man's ascent to power? I'm talking about Adolf Hitler. That, that 70 to 85 million people died in World War II. At the time, in the 1940s, early 1940s, that was 3% of the entire world population died because this man came to power and did what he did. Now, I'm not wanting to give you a history lesson today. There are millions of books out there that talk about what happened in Germany and how this man be began as an elected leader but then took over and, and all that. There's all kinds of stuff there. But what I'm concerned about for us to learn about is this. There was a very active church in Germany at that time. And by and large, they were silent. And not only were they silent, many of them were actually co-conspirators along with him. And to go back and read that part of it is to really understand something that you and I need to learn because we have a living example less, just a little over 100 years ago, I guess, that, that of what, when people didn't stand up and didn't call evil evil when the evil came. Now, you know, make, make it real, real clear here today. When we look back on that, there's no Hitler out there on the horizon uh, that we're looking at today. We're not standing against uh, some Hitlers. You know, some people uh, think uh, somebody by the name of Joe Biden or Donald Trump is Hitler, you know. And if you think that, then you don't know history. And two, you're a little too ingrained in partisan politics, you know, if you're going you're to say that. That's not what we're talking about. But there is a system, there is a groups of people that would really like to move things in the culture. Matter of fact, no, they wouldn't like to. They have 
move things in the culture in a way that goes very much against what we know to be truth and what will ultimately bring a collapse of culture. So we're not talking about getting involved in the kingdom in politics. We're talking about standing for truth that we know is truth that will help people flourish and, and help people be what they, what they ought to be. So why, why am I going back and doing this? Just, just realize, as I've said, there's shocking similarities with the, the there are a lot of differences, but there's a lot of similarities with what the people of faith failed to do in that day and what seems to be happening today in our world as well. And, and this was a really important thing. We have them. They didn't have us. You understand that? We, we have an example. We, we realize someone who made this mistake and literally, understand when I say this, hell was unleashed on planet Earth because people of faith were silent. Okay? And, and, and because of that, we, we've got to, they didn't have an example before them of this. You and I do. So we have an even greater responsibility. And one, one other thing that I would, I would say is this. There were some heroes during that time as well. There were some men and women who stood for truth. And one of those men was a man by the name of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And everybody needs to know who he is if you're a believer. He was a pastor, a young pastor. And he, he saw what was happening, and he stood and with unbelievable personal sacrifice that ultimately ended up with him being imprisoned and executed before that war was over, before our allied troops moved in and liberated them. And this man paid for it with his life. And during the time that he was standing against it, he wrote down some things, and he actually wrote a couple of books. And one of the books he wrote... We call it today, but it was just basically called Discipleship in German, but it, we call it The Cost of Discipleship Day. It's a classic book, absolute classic book about cheap grace and not realizing that what, what really it costs, what it means to be a believer, what it means to stand up, what it means to speak out in love about truth that is there. So we, we're looking at that for that reason, but let's look at the book of Jude, okay? Let's bring this back in to the scriptures here today. But I will be mentioning some of that along the way, and I just want you to see how we learn from that as we fulfill what God has called us to do here. But when we come to Jude here, we recognize that he is speaking to us about identity in these first two verses before he even gets to the point of telling them to contend for the faith. Several years ago at my home here in Trophy Club, I started receiving some packages in the mail over, the, over several days, and they were all video games for an Xbox. That's really cool. I didn't order them. I didn't pay for them. They just started showing up. There's just only one problem with that. I don't own an Xbox, and I never have. I thought, what is going on here? I started trying to do a little investigation. You know where this is leading. I found out someone had stolen my identity and got a hold of my Social Security number, and somehow or another were, they were opening accounts and ordering things from companies that I didn't even know about. And what a mess that was to get in there and reclaim my identity. You know how hard it is to call someone and try to tell them that it's you talking on the phone, the real Barry Klingon, not the one they made up? It took me a long time. Matter of fact, to this day, I still have to protect things because of that time when they stole by. You may have been through something like that. You know, in the, in the day of digital technology, it seems like it's real easy or a lot easier for people to steal our identity. But, you know, when we come into spiritual matters, we recognize something about the enemy. He's been trying to do this for years. He's, he's been trying to get believers to not realize who they are and what Christ purchased for them when he died on the cross for their sins. Oh, yeah, we, we, yeah he, he saved me, and, and, and I'm going to heaven when I die, but so much more he did. And so many times, so many believers who believe in Jesus live beneath the privileges of which he has has died and purchased for them to live in. I, I will tell you this, and I think long and hard because I don't want to overspeak here today, but I will say this, in all the years that God has allowed me to be a pastor and preach, I think this is the number one issue that people fail in their Christian experience by being overcome by sin, by being overcome by all kinds of things. That have, all of it, I think, goes back to the fact that we never fully get into understanding who we are in Christ. That's why Paul, over and over, when he wrote his letters, said, in Christ. 
In Christ, in Christ. We are this in Christ. We have, have a salvation that's incorruptible, undefined. In Christ, in Christ, over and over. That, that his people that he was writing to would understand who they are. You know, every letter, including the letter we're looking at here from this man named Jude, is written and they all start out telling you who you are and what God has done for you. Knowing that identity, announcing that identity, it is the key to the level of success and experience of God you're going to have in this world and victory over sin. Let me give you some things real quick and real simple right out of this first uh, chapter here about our identity as Jude gives it to us. First of all, uh, there, there's about four, four markers here, four characteristics that he gives that I'm going to highlight here. First of all, just that word identity. Do you notice Jude, like most of the writers in these letters in the New Testament, starts by telling who he is? Now, there's about five Judes or Judases, that's actually the word that it's used there, uh, mentioned in the Bible, in the New Testament. But it's real clear who this one is. He said two things about himself. You you learn a lot by what someone tells you about themselves. He said, I'm a bondservant of Jesus Christ, and I'm the brother of James. Now, that last one, being the brother of James, gives us a real detail of who he is there. We understand uh, uh, for sure who he is there. James, no doubt, by him just saying that he's the brother of James, James would be the one that is actually what we would call a half-brother of our Lord. Uh, He was the one that would ultimately become pastor of the church in Jerusalem. He was the one that, by Acts chapter 15, was so much in charge that he kind of supervised the first church council when they came and decided whether the Gentiles could come into the church or not. And he was kind of in charge of that and kind of and delivered the verdict there. So he was looked upon as someone uh, that was uh, a, a leader in that early church. He actually wrote the book that we have in our Bible called the book of James. And so Jude is his brother and a half-brother of our Lord as well. We find in Matthew chapter 13, verse 55, that we find these words when they could not believe Jesus was doing what he did. When they knew his background, they said, Is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? And that's Jude or Jude, uh, Judas that we have in this, this passage here. So that's who he is. He's identifying himself by who he is, but he, he uses this other term. We skip over this because we read it all the time. He's a bondservant of Jesus Christ. Now, if I was the half-brother of Jesus, and by the way, we know from the Scripture that none of his brothers believed in him while he was here on this earth. Uh, Matter of fact, when he started his ministry, they went to him and tried to take him to the crazy home and said, you're crazy, you've lost your mind, come back home, you know, or we're going to take you somewhere and shelter you. They didn't believe who you who he was, it was only after the resurrection that his brothers came to believe that. But, but think about this. If I had it on my resume, I grew up with Jesus. I believe I'd be telling you about that. You know, if, oh, let me tell you who I am. Right, you can talk about who you are. I grew up with Jesus. Yeah, he was my brother. You know, that's what I would want to announce. He doesn't do that. He says my identity is not in that. My identity is in the fact that I am a bondservant of Jesus. That's a slave. That's not just a servant. That's somebody who surrendered all their rights and has surrendered completely to the lordship of Jesus Christ over them. Wow. I mean, think about that. You know, when you see people in history that followed Christ and had so much that they could have claimed but the more in love with Jesus and the more they found that they, they surrendered all of that. It's, it's amazing. I was talking to Amy this week about how I felt like some of there's just been some people that have come along that are just too good for this world. They just fell in love with Jesus and got so close into understanding the identity. God just said, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, I believe, might have been one of those people. Keith Green, I don't know if you ever heard of him or not. He was going to be the next movie star that Hollywood had already deemed that he was going to be the, you know, the, the heartthrob for teenagers and all that. They had it all planned out for him to do that. And then he got saved. And, and he just fell in love with Jesus. And he lived in this big Hollywood mansion in this big Hollywood hills. And he started bringing in 
uh, you know, beggars off the street into his house so much so that he filled his house up with those who didn't have a place and the neighbors didn't really like that in the area that he lived in. He finally left there and came out here to Lindell, Texas and was, you know, started a great ministry there. He was a, a songwriter and a, and a musician and he was incredibly talented and he, he just loved God with all of his heart and he just believed what he read and lived by the Sermon on the Mount and, and he was killed in a plane crash with his, with his kids one day. Uh, there is buried out here in Texas as a young man. I think, Lord, he had so much to offer. It's kind of like Enoch in the Bible. You know, Enoch, the Bible says he walked with God, and one day he was not, for God took him. I mean, he's walking with God, and God just says, it's time you just come on home. And he brings him into his presence. Why? These guys like this, like Jude, like Paul, they somehow or another realized and got a hold of the fact that the greatest thing I have in this world is to recognize not all the things I've accomplished, but I'm simply a child of God and a bondservant, a slave of Jesus Christ. Now, that's radical identity. That's getting to that place of, of, of really getting over our own insecurities and, and recognizing that he's in charge and doing that. The second word I give you here is security because it's, he says some uh, statements here. And I'll just, just look at them real quick with me. I'm called, I'm, I'm, I'm sanctified, or I'm loved, I'm preserved. He says, these are, these are not just out of his identity. The second thing of security, I know I'm secure in who I am. And I know that because why? Number one, I'm called, he says, in this passage of Scripture that we've read to you. Called, he says. The called in, in, in Paul's thinking or, or in... in Jude's thinking here is the, is the elect from all eternity. You know, it's, it's God's call. We like to say the pastor's called or you get called to the ministry or whatever. But the truth is, all believers have been called. The fact that you're here this morning, right now, most I think everybody's listening to me right now. You're here because God called you. Not called you here. God called you to be a believer. If you think about your testimony, and some of you grew up in wonderful Christian homes and and some of you came to the Lord as teenagers like me, and some of you came to the Lord as adults. But when you look back at it, you realize it was all God, wasn't it? I mean, God did this. You didn't do it. We love him because he first loved us. He, he has called us into this fellowship. You know, that's just enough to stop and be thankful for right there, isn't it? God called me. God brought me into this thing. God opened my eyes. When I was lost, when I was sinking, he lifted me up and put me on solid ground. He did these things. God did these things. My favorite saying is the evangelist said he took me out of the middle of nothing, put me in the middle of everything, and in the process gave me such a heavenly jerk. I've been out of joint with the world ever since. I believe that. I believe that. That's a, it's enough to just shout and praise God. I didn't deserve it. There's nothing attractive in me. There was nothing good in me, but God loved me, and he called me in. And I walk in that abundance of grace. That's a security I have in my life. I'm God's child. When you know that and you walk in that, you're, you, you, you've got a secure situation in your life. I'm, I'm loved. Now, now my, my Bible that I read to you today says sanctified. It's got a little asterisk by it. Uh, if you have anything other than a King James Version or a New King James Version today, it says beloved there. This is one of those times in the original language that there is a textual variant, they call it. It's really fascinating to me. Because the Bible originally written in Greek, the word for sanctified and the word for beloved, if I could say both of those words, you would recognize just how similar they sound. And you know how they copied the scriptures in the early days? They didn't have a Xerox machine, amen? So they all sat down, men that were trained to write, and a speaker would stand up and read to them. And as he would read the letter to them, they would all write it down. And then each one of those would get passed around. One might go down into Egypt. One might be over in Asia Minor in the Ephesus area or whatever. And if one person heard it wrong or wrote just a little something different, then everybody that copied that one in Asia Minor followed that difference in it. It's called textual criticism. And it's fascinating. And here's what's the most fascinating thing about it. You would think there would be all kinds of errors in doing it that way without having a real copy, without the printing press being uh, invented. You'd think, oh, this is going to get just all messed up. No, uh, there's no major doctrine. There's no major truth changed anywhere by any textual variation. 
So some of the newer manuscripts, or older, I should say older manuscripts, but newer translations uh, put beloved in there. The, the one that the King James Version was based upon has sanctified in there. You know what? Loved or sanctified. It doesn't change. Both Bible tells us both of those, doesn't it? In the Scripture and other places, nothing changes. We are beloved, and we are set aside because of that love by God. And then one other thing he says that we're preserved there as well. Sanctified and preserved in Jesus Christ. I love that word. That word means that uh, it's, it's a word that was used of a, of a prison guard who constantly kept watch over someone. God is protecting me. Peter said it this way in 1 Peter 1.5, we are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed. We're kept by the power of God. You know what? We sang something today. It made me think of the old hymn that we sing, you know, bind my wandering heart to thee. Because what do we all know if we've walked with the Lord? Left to ourself, we step away. Our heart grows cold. We start we quit going to Bible study. We, we quit going to church. We, we start doing it on our own, and we get colder. And, and for you long, we're, we're, we're doing things that we never thought we would do. And it's so easy to do that. And here's what God says. I'm going to preserve those that I've called. I'm going to, start, I'm going to keep watch over you. And I don't know about you, but I'm getting a lot of gray hair on my head. Matter of fact, I don't have any. That's why I got a beard, by the way, you know, it can't, COVID beard came in black, and I said, man, I got a little black hair on my body. I'm going to keep it, you know, for a while, you know. But, but that means I've been around a long time, and I want to tell you something. It's God's grace that keeps us. He doesn't just bring us in. He keeps us. There have been some times when I want to step away, and the loving, disciplining hand of God brings me back to the fold every time. His convicting power of the Holy Spirit in my life or His arranging of circumstances that force me back on the path that He's called me to be. Thank you, God, for calling me. Thank you, God, for giving me the security in my life that I am loved, I'm sanctified, I'm preserved, I'm called. Thank you, Lord. That was our second word, security. Third word is victory. Because He gives us just some words. Well, you just pass over these words. It had been easy just going to the what we call the meat later on, but I just like to look at these words. Verse 2, mercy, peace, and love. He's given me these. Mercy, I have atonement in my life. God, who is rich in mercy. Mercy, the judgment we all deserved is covered by the mercy of God. Oh, my goodness. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy in my life. Thank you. Lord, for your mercy in the people of God's life. I've experienced mercy at the hand of God. A great singer that uh, was with the Gaither Trio, you know, a crazy guy, you know, that sings with them, you know. I mean, that was a wonderful story of him one night. He went to sing somewhere and didn't get paid. I've told you this before. And he got mad because he didn't get paid. And church enjoyed his music but didn't give him any love offering or anything. He left there that night. Talking about Mark Lowry. He said, God, your servant didn't get paid tonight. He said, your servant wanted to go to McDonald's. Your servant's hungry, but he didn't get any paid tonight. God looked down at him and said, yeah, you didn't get paid, but it sure beats hell, doesn't it? I love that story. Sure beats hell. He said, yep, your servant didn't get paid, but it sure beats hell. Oh, my Thank you for your mercy, God. Thank you for your peace, God. I have an amnesty with God. This word peace is the idea of two warring partners brought to the peace table. Amnesty is forgiveness without punishment and reconciliation without price. God has given me that peace in my life. Peace that passes all understanding. Folks, do we celebrate this enough? This is what God's given us. Listen, when you contend for the faith and it gets messy and you don't say it exactly right and maybe you don't say it in love the way you should and you're doing this and you're doing that and you get attacked for this and you, you're willing to step up so you, you, you become a target. And I, but thank God, even in the midst of it. Matter of fact, God delights in doing that. Why? He said, I'll put a table for you prepared in the presence of your enemies. That means when your enemies are barking at you, you're going to sit down and dine at a feast. That's the kind of peace that God gives to his people. Thank God for these things. This is what Jesus died to give us. 
mercy, peace, and love. This is the acceptance I have. The unmerited, unlimited, unconditional love of God. And finally, the last word is prosperity. Can you believe I get four words out of those two verses? I have identity, security, victory, and this last word I say is prosperity. And where do I get that from? Mercy, peace, and love multiplied to you. Multiplied to you in abundance. Everything God blesses multiplies. And when God blesses something, and when God gives you peace, and he blesses you with peace, he multiplies that. He multiplies the, the love, the mercy in our lives. Thank you, Lord, for that and for what I have in my life. Now, look, we're going to call some difficult things. When we get on down to verse 4, they're going to talk about false teachers. We're going to talk about angels and demons and we're going to talk about these people that go in the air of Cain going back to creation again. Uh, you know, he's going, to, he's going to talk all about these things. But listen, it all, this, and you, you may be here some and not here some, but listen, you got to see this big picture. It's worth us taking one message and talking about who we are in Christ. Because if you don't get that, really, you, you can't go any further. I, I've seen some people that that love to put themselves out there and contend for the faith, but they're so absent of the love of God and the filling of the Holy Spirit that it's just grinding metal on metal and it's just something that somebody just kind of loves to do just because they like to hear their own voice. These are people they are speaking up that are very firmly rooted in who they are in Christ. I know who I am. I'm called. I'm loved. I've experienced the mercy and peace and love of God. I know I've got victory in my life. I know the security in my life does not come from this world. It comes from where you say, Pastor, if you contend for the faith and the culture gets really collapsed, people are going to hate you. Yeah, uh, I think our Lord was put on the cross for it. And, and I think we're following his footsteps. And I think there were a lot of martyrs that were the seed of the church. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer and others, no, nobody's at that point today. But that's where it leads ultimately to because the world doesn't like the truth and the world wants to go in rebellion in the way they want to go and to speak the truth sometimes causes conflict but when you know who you are hmm. I was reading about Bonhoeffer this week and I'll close Bonhoeffer this week I was reading about him and when he was this was mid 30s so he's uh, 1930s mid 1930s so he's you know five, six, seven years away from being martyred. But he told a friend, he said, you know, I just can't wait until Jesus returns. All this conflict, all this animosity, all these lies will all be gone forever. I long to be with Jesus and be in his kingdom. You know, he already recognized and who he was in Christ and what was coming and where his security was long before he had to actually stand in front of a firing squad. You know, that, that's where it comes from. It comes from that radically knowing that identity. Now, let me just say this real quickly. You only can have this identity if you truly are one of his, if he's called you. He's spoken to your heart. If you know him as your Lord and Savior, if you've started that journey with him, if you've been introduced to him, if you've stepped over, if you've been born again, if you've all the wonderful things the scripture calls it, that's where it begins. Make sure you know that. And once you know that, find out what he's done for you. Live in it. Find your security in it. Find your identity in it. Find your victory in it. Find your prosperity in it. And letting him just overflow in your life with those things. And live in it that way. You have to know who you are before you can stand and contend for the faith. Let's pray together today. Father, thank you for your word. It is powerful. It is true. And even in these short little introductory verses, we find a great foundation for what we need to be able to follow through in your word and what it teaches us and what it calls us to do. I thank you, Lord, for these that are gathered here today. I thank you that, Lord, today even you've enriched them, I believe, as they have received the revelation from your truth to walk in that identity. And, Lord, we're all refreshed in that here today. Help us to constantly find our security in that, I pray. Help us to constantly find our identity in that, who you are and what you have done for us. We pray these things. We believe these things with all of our heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.